Okay, this video is going to be about aluminum and health, especially the relationship of aluminum to dementia, but we'll talk about its other systemic effects. Uh, this painting right here is by Delacroix about um, the play Hamlet by Shakespeare. Okay, so this is Hamlet right here, and this is his friend Horatio. This is actually a famous scene, the, the grave digger scene, the last poor York, I knew him, Horatio. But the reason I'm showing you this is because... You know, Dr. McDougall's talked a lot about Alzheimer's, and he is right that aluminum is a major neurotoxin. It is a major neurotoxin. There are also very experienced researchers who believe it is the main cause of Alzheimer's that were exposed to tremendous amounts of it, you know, in the water, in um, foods, etc. And I'm kind of joking here that one of the things that Hamlet says to his friend Horatio is there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And the joke being that, of course, you know, the brain is more my specialty, of course. So aluminum is just one of many neurotoxins. So I'm just joking with McDougal. McDougal's doing pretty well, by the way. I saw him make a video. He's about 76 years of age. He's still really mentally sharp. And I'm jealous of him, too, because he's retired. So he can sit around reading all the time. I got to work all the time. I'm working home full time. On my last two nights, I got home like around 8 o'clock. I was working so much. So I don't have as much time to make these videos as I want. But I think you're going to find this video quite helpful. As usual, I'm going to come at it from a much more different angle. Between watching McDougal's and my videos, and some other people made some pretty good videos about aluminum and Alzheimer's as well. Um, Jeff Nelson has a good one about it. And there's other people out there who made good videos on it. Um, I think you'll find the subject reasonably well covered. Okay, here we go. So here is aluminum, the molecule. Typically it has an overall positive charge of plus three. And you can sort of think of, you know, F minus as the great evil anion, negatively charged ion. And aluminum is sort of like the great evil positively charged ion. So it tends to have a relatively fixed positive charge or fixed valence of three plus. That, because of that, it can kind of mimic what magnesium does to some extent. This is going to be relevant because magnesium with its two plus positive charge, it routinely interacts with phosphates, which are highly negatively charged. Okay, and for example, magnesium is what holds the second and third phosphate on top of an adenosine triphosphate, an ATP. Okay, whereas aluminum can get into all kinds of business where it really has no business. Aluminum does not belong in the human body. There should not be any in the, in the human body. Okay, it comes from mining and digging into, you know, these uh, Earth's crust. And we really should have minded our own business because we've opened up Pandora's box, so to speak, digging up this aluminum stuff. Okay, this is the most common form of it, but this is just the way you'll see it written. All right. Now, aluminum... There's good uh, reviews about the toxic properties of aluminum. Um, it can be absorbed through the skin. Most commonly, we think of that in personal care products, especially deodorants. And it it's plugs up the sweat glands, which you really don't want to do, because not only are you having aluminum absorbed into your body from these transdermal things, you're also uh, blocking up your sweat glands, preventing yourself from excreting the uh, the aluminum that's already in you. So exercising and sweating is one way to lower your body's load of aluminum. Okay, um, the worst type of aluminum exposure in terms of transdermal absorption is, is putting it in your armpit where you have shared lymphatics with the breast, upper outer quadrant, and that's why the upper outer quadrant of breast cancer has gone up so dramatically since the 1920s when it used to be about 30% of breast cancer. Now it's about 60% of breast cancer. Okay, so here's AL, the aluminum being absorbed around these glands here. Oh, and by the way, you can inhale aluminum and then bring it into your body. And there were some stupid people that volunteered for a research study where they would go sniff the air on a volcano that was partially active, something like this, I expect. And, you know, pretty quick after that, their urine levels of aluminum excretion went up dramatically. And so what I'm saying is if anybody ever asks you to go walk next to a, a partially active volcano, just turn in the opposite direction, run for your life. It's stupid. You're inhaling aluminum, it's gonna make you sick, it's gonna cause dementia potentially. Yeah, doing it once, I don't really know. I don't have experience with it, but I'm just saying is, that's the kind of stuff that gets people in trouble. Random stupidity with no gain. All right, so stay away from volcanoes. Like I said, that's where it comes from, the Earth's crust, the mountains. If you inhale aluminum, that's like the worst because it goes right through the olfactory nerve, which is connected to the brain. 
right next to your olfactory cortex, your entorhinal cortex. And we previously talked about that, that, you know, this guy, I think his name's Gary Lynch, something like that. He's from a Loma Linda neuroscientist, really bright guy. He wrote a book about his theories of brain development. And the gist of it was he thinks our main cognitive association cortex came from sort of a primitive um, nasal olfactory cortex whereby one can associate smells to all kinds of things. We can associate smells to the people in our life, to our girlfriend, to our pets, to what we're having for dinner, whatever it might be. But the point is it can freely associate anything with anything versus a lot of the tactile sensations, you know, that type of sensory cortex is not as capable of the sophisticated association. We basically free associate the entire contents of the world by metaphor, analogy, and comparison. That's how we map cognitive space. Okay, so anyways, the stupidest thing to do would be like to use spray on aluminum for your armpits and then to inhale it into your olfactory nerve and have that go right to your brain, okay? And don't be spraying it on your kids either. It's completely stupid. All right, the next thing is when you eat food or let's say drink water, it goes into your belly and then it's absorbed through your gut into your blood. And the aluminum in water is worse than the aluminum in food. At least some of the chemicals in food like the phytates will decrease the amount that gets absorbed. But when you drink water, a lot of that is absorbed, like at least three times as much. And they routinely put water into tap water. I mean, they put aluminum into municipal tap water because paradoxically, it makes the water clear up in its appearance, but it's not good for your health. Okay. You also will inhale aluminum when it's in the air, and it can get in the air in a lot of ways, unfortunately. You know, factories, uh, the planes flying overhead, you know, leaving trails, unfortunately. Um, we talked about transdermal absorption in front of a lot of personal care products. It has an estrogenic effect, but it also has neurotoxic effects. Because it can mimic magnesium and because it can interact with phosphates, and as well as other negatively charged uh, subgroups on, let's say, proteins like carboxylic acids, it can interact with a lot of things. Aluminum is a major poison. There's nothing good about it. It's all bad. And you need to know that because... Uh, you will be more likely to make the effort to avoid it. Okay, so this stuff contains aluminum. It's bad for you, and that's some of that you're inhaling, and that's going up towards your olfactory nerve. Not good. One of the good news is, though, I'll tell you about the good news and what you can do to minimize it, but just so you're aware of it, okay? All right, aluminum also causes infertility. It uh, contributes to infertility. It lowers uh, sperm counts. It damages sperm, makes more abnormal sperm. It... Um, inhibits uh, one of the enzymes in Krebs cycle, so it's a mitochondria inhibitor also. Uh, animals exposed to more aluminum have lower weight of their testicles. It lowers testosterone levels. Now that's something guys care about. There's a lot of things young guys in particular don't care about. It's hard to have a conversation with them. They're so bullheaded, so to speak. But they care about their testosterone levels. Lots of men do. And testosterone levels are dramatically increased, decreased throughout the Western world. And aluminum is a major contributor because people are getting a lot of aluminum. Like I said, it's coming from the sky above. It's in most all the tap water. It's in lots of foods. And there's lots of other ways. We're going to talk about how to avoid exposure to it a little while later. It also causes infertility, decreased fertility in women and in female rodents here. And I just want to let you know the fact that soy is subsidized, which is estrogenic and damages the female reproductive tract and lowers male sperm counts. It's just a coincidence. Okay, atrazine sprayed on corn, strongly estrogenic, uh, contributes to infertility, can turn a, female, a male frog into a female frog. The fact that those two foods are subsidized and ubiquitous in processed foods, that is just a coincidence. The fact that aluminum is, you know, routine in tap water as a clarifier and that you absorb a lot more of it when it's in tap water and also F minus is in tap water and F minus and aluminum form complexes where they bind together the positive charge of the aluminum attracts the negative charge of the F minus and that causes increased intestinal absorption and the F minus is famous for adding that to chemicals to help them cross the blood brain barrier and to get into your brain and it causes brain damage so it makes you infertile, it's an estrogen, metalloestrogen, so it contributes to um, estrogenic effects causing obesity. It actually is also toxic to the pancreas, contributes to the effects of causing uh, pancreas toxicity and loss of beta cells. It also contributes to uh, hypertension. So the fact that these commonly, widely available subsidized are just routinely added to the water and stuff, and by the way, there's also a synergistic amplification of toxicity, especially for oxidative stress, when aluminum is present in the context of iron overload and there's mandatory rules that 
iron is added to many foods. They're, they're called fortified with iron, okay? And so what I'm saying is, I know it's all just a coincidence that all of these foods here have a synergistic amplified effect to make you fat and fertile and stupid. Okay, it's just a coincidence, all right? All right, it's just a coincidence. It's, it's coming from the plains up in the sky with the trails. It's just a coincidence that there's all these estrogenic chemicals in your tap water that also make you fat and sick. It's just a coincidence that everybody carries a cell phone nowadays that tracks them everywhere they go and the typical dumbass puts it in their front pocket and microwaves their balls. It's a low power microwave transmitter. And I cannot tell you how many young guys I see, you know, macho about their muscles, you know, walking around with a cell phone in their front pocket, microwaving their balls. Okay, or sitting with their laptop computer on their lap. Gee, I wonder why my testosterone level's so low. Oh, another thing that's kind of funny is that aluminum gets into the testicles. It can cross the blood-brain barrier. Anything that can cross the blood-brain barrier quite often can cross the blood testicle barrier and the blood ovary barrier, okay? But it also gets into sperm. So we just talked about sweating a lot from exercise can lower your bodily levels of uh, aluminum. But also, uh, if you spank the monkey, uh, that will also lower your body levels of uh, aluminum a little bit. Okay, it's pro-oxidant. Like you said, it, 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 it has an amplification or a catalytic effect to worsen the oxidative stress associated with iron overload. Can you see how this is all sort of heading into a perfect storm as a person gets older and older in a Western country? They're becoming more and more overloaded with aluminum because it accumulates in the body. And they're becoming more and more overloaded with iron because that also accumulates in the body. And these will synergistically start to interact with each other, especially if they become free, meaning that they're not bound to something else that prevents them from reacting with other things. Okay, we talked about... Um, Aluminum right here has a 3 plus a valence, okay? We previously talked about iron having a variable valence. It's a transitional metal. That means you know, it has more than one valence. It could be 2 plus, it could be 3 plus, most commonly. It can actually have other valences, but those are the most common ones. Aluminum is relatively fixed at usually having a valence of plus, three, of plus 3. And like I said, it can substitute for magnesium. Okay, aluminum is toxic to your intestinal lining. It causes leaky gut. Um, it kills the enterocytes. The gut is called the enteric tract. So the cells, sites of cells, enterocytes are the cells that line the gut. Just a single layer of cells. It's a thin wall. Um, it can open up the tight junctions. It'll cause reactive oxygen species, ROS, inflammation. And it's also an immunosuppressant. It suppresses your immune system. Another reason why you want to avoid aluminum. Okay, um, cellular oxidative stress levels in patients uh, given aluminum were 38 times higher than the control population. Okay, pretty toxic. All right, and then I'll show you another slide of some of the things it can do to your intestinal lining. Um, it's just showing here. I mean, I, I realize it's a little hard for you to see this, but I'm just giving you an example of a paper showing how it's causing destruction of parts of the intestinal uh, lining and causing little infections in the intestinal line. They call them Crypsolibricum abscesses. It increases the risk of Crohn's disease. It increases the risk of a ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease. So it is toxic to your intestinal lining. And that's why you want to avoid it as much as you can. And of course, it also can get up into the brain, especially when it's complex with F minus. So they go together. And I know it's just a coincidence that both of these things that go together and cause brain damage and cause low IQs and cause dementia, that they're both put into your drinking water. So most people can't escape from that. You can remove it from your water by reverse osmosis, by distillation, and some ion exchange water filters. Okay, another general principle, like we sort of said, is that things that cause leaky gut, they often will cause leaky BBB. BBB, in this context, is blood-brain barrier, and I use all capital letters. Okay, um, traumatic brain injury will do it. Increased blood brain barrier permeability and gut permeability. Same thing with a stroke, high fat diet, omega 6 cooking oils, um, and aluminum. So you want to avoid these things because it's a dangerous thing to be opening up simultaneously the blood brain barrier and the gut barrier. Meaning, because what that means, if you have increased gut permeability, leaky gut, bad things can get into your blood that don't belong there, like bacterial LPS, lipopolysaccharide, endotoxin from the gram negatives or LTA, lipotychoic acid, the endotoxin from the gram-positive bacteria. And if you have increased blood-brain barrier, 
permeability simultaneously, there's increased likelihood they're going to get into your brain parenchyma. And like I said too, it's especially when fluoride forms a complex with the aluminum that it's more able to cross the blood-brain barrier, get into your brain, make you stupid. So this is another one of these review papers about aluminum. And I just want to show you this. This is just some of the things alumina does. And again, it's kind of like F minus. How could it do so many bad things? Because it's an imposter. It mimics um, your magnesium and it just starts binding with a lot of uh, important proteins in your blood and in your cells and damages them. Okay. So oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation, and it's also synergistic in that effect um, to make it worse. And I can tell you the world's experts on aluminum, they think oxidative stress is the most important thing that it does to destroy tissue. It does a lot of other bad things. Okay, we talked about it being an immunosuppressant. And these are all scientific references. You're gonna find that there are tons and tons of papers. If you want to do nothing else but read aluminum papers all day long for a month, there would be plenty to keep you busy. Okay, it's amyloidogenic, meaning that it can cause abnormal clotting. And we've talked about that before too, how abnormal clotting typically means that you're taking a normal protein in an alpha helix configuration that's shaped like a cylinder, like a soda pop can, and you're smushing it, flattening it out like pieces of papers, which enables them to stack up and form these big bulky, first oligomers, then polymers, meaning big aggregates of a chemical, and that can lead to them precipitating out of solution and becoming non-functional, other than their size, having mass effect. It's a long story, but that's related to brain damage and prion mechanisms. Okay, it's a metalloestrogen. We know that it increases breast cancer risk, kills intestinal uh, cells, causing apoptosis on them, some of them. Um, it can inhibit membrane ATPases, and that's relevant because you need your plasma membrane ATP pumps to run your calcium pump system. Therefore, it can cause increased cytoplasmic calcium. Therefore, it's also an excitotoxin to the brain. Okay, so that's worth knowing. It does a lot of bad things to the brain. It's a mitochondrial toxin. It blocks... Uh, Krebs cycle, um, in particular, you know, succinity hydrogenase, for example, that enzyme, which is actually part of electron transport as well. So that's pretty messed up. It's messing up your Krebs cycle uh, sequence, and it's also messing up your electron transport, oxfos, oxidative phosphorylation, and the inner mitochondrial membrane. These are your major ATP production pathways, and it's messing them up, so you can't make adequate energy. Okay, while well, it's simultaneously demanding more energy because it's causing increased cytoplasm calcium. That's a double screw job. Okay, remember how I told you calcium, uh, caffeine is a double screw job because it's a vasoconstrictor, drops blood supply to the cerebral cortex of the brain while simultaneously causing increased glutamate transmission as an excitotoxin, meaning that it's um, increasing the metabolic activity of the brain while simultaneously dropping the blood flow to the brain. You don't want that. And why might that happen, given that caffeine, for example, mimics the acute stress response? Because when you remember I talked about the three-part brain of uh, the triune brain of McLean, the Harvard anatomist, the gist of it being that your brain stem is your reptile brain, just primitive stuff. The id, the, the id you know, your primitive ego. Okay, anyways, give me food, give me a blood pressure. Okay, uh, and then the second one is your mammal brain, shaped like a letter C, the limbic system, and that is your instinctual brain, fight or flight. And then the top brain, the third brain, the three-part brain of McLean, is your cerebral cortex. And the point is, we remember stress, uh, which is the, the, rep, the mammal brain, okay, being chased by a tiger in the dark, as you just got to run for your life, survive the next five minutes. So you don't need a sophisticated cerebral cortex trying to figure out the nuance of what your girlfriend just said to you, okay? So you don't need more blood flow to your cerebral cortex. So that's why it does that, okay? But you only want that happening when you need it to happen, not randomly because you're ingesting a drug like caffeine, for example. And so the point I'm making here is aluminum also gives you a double screw job, increasing metabolic activity while simultaneously decreasing energy production. Not good. And like I said too, it increases hypertension, diabetes. <laughs> okay, so here is part of the way that this is a paper talking about how uh, aluminum will cause pancreatic islet cell necrosis. So here's pancreatic islet cells, and some of them are destroyed uh, when these rodents were given um, for 28 straight days relatively high amounts of aluminum, okay? So it's associated with diabetes. Is diabetes more, com more common? Yeah, it's super common, super common. Most Americans, you know, the majority of them over 50, they're either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Okay, aluminum and brain health. Um, so Dr. McDougall says aluminum is the main cause of Alzheimer's disease. And again, I don't even like the word Alzheimer's. Call it dementia. 
And I think it's a major cause of uh, dementia. It definitely is a major neurotoxin. But I would say it's one of many. There's a lot of other things. And I talked about that in other lectures, the whole deletory theory of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, the mouse equivalents. I went through my own theory of, uh, you know, neurovascular uncoupling. Okay, we're going to focus on aluminum, though, for this lecture. Okay, biochemistry of the human body. This is said by a guy named Christopher Exley. He's very famous, probably the most famous researcher of aluminum in the world. He says that the human body runs like a symphony, and the metals uh, under normal conditions are like conductors, including magnesium. And he says that aluminum has no purpose in the human body. It replaces magnesium and causes a cacophony. A cacophony. Okay. He says that I am convinced that aluminum is the main cause of Alzheimer's disease. He actually says that he thinks without aluminum, you don't get Alzheimer's disease. And now, to me, that's like, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, okay? I don't agree with that at all because I'll tell you why later. So, you know, if you devote your whole life to research in one molecule, aluminum, you sort of think it's the center of the whole world, and it's not. But it's a very important neurotoxin, that's for sure. Okay, he also gives examples how aluminum can cause autoimmune disease, and that's interesting as well because, you know, most people can get an improvement in their autoimmune disease if they can prevent leaky gut, but some still have a lot of problems, and so one of those reasons why they can still be having problems is because of aluminum. We also talked that glyphosate can cause autoimmune disease by damaging tissues and turning them into like um, a DAMPS, if you will, or a PAMPS. So DAMPS is damage-associated molecular patterns. PAMPS is a pathogen-associated molecular patterns, meaning that when they damage the tissue, they confuse the immune system into thinking it's a disease, and it can react against that. Okay, um, it's been said then that our bodies have no way to protect us against aluminum. We're not that good at it. Luckily, the antioxidants from plants help to protect us, so that's another reason why plants will help us. Aluminum is pro-oxidant. It promotes uh, BAP just means beta amyloid protein oxidation, especially when um, iron is present, like increased iron. We talked about this and amyloidogenic transformation where you go from alpha helix to beta pleated sheet formation, and that's what leads them to tending to precipitate out. Okay, um, that's, there's a source from this book. Aluminum is abundant in the Earth's crust, was mostly buried away in the mountains until mining spilled it out, and also volcanoes. Stay away from volcanoes. All right, um, let's see what else. It tends to bind negatively charged things, especially like phosphates, carboxylic acids. Um, neurons are brain cells. They live for our entire life. That's why we can remember things from our childhood. And the problem with that is it means that they can accumulate aluminum all through one's life. So that's bad. If you've got some gut cell enterocyte that's going to be shed after a couple days, it's not a big deal. It'll shed the aluminum into your into your feces and it'll excrete it from your body. But when it's accumulating in your neuron for decades, it can eventually get to reach a threshold effect and damage the neuron. Um, it also, like I said, accumulates in the testicles and in the ovaries and is associated with infertility. We excrete it uh, from the bile into the feces, into the urine. The urine's the main way. And the experts on the subject feel that the urine 24-hour collection is the best way to measure body levels of it. I'd recommend you study this guy if you if you want to study it in more detail. Okay, um, aluminum first case was described about 1901. It didn't become common until the 1940s after World War II. The relevance of those statements is that, you know, a lot of other diseases, they've been around a long time. Why is it that Alzheimer's didn't get described until 1901? Partly because the, te the technology was backward in the past. And, but what, what McDougall's getting at here is he's saying it's because aluminum wasn't widely available until this time. And they think they're just sort of starting to mine it around those days. And, you know, the familial type where they're more vulnerable to it is the first patient who had it. You know, she got it, uh, Eloise Alzheimer's. She's only, Augusta was her first name. El, Alzheimer was the name of the guy who discovered it, the doctor. But the point was, what they're saying here with this statement is that it didn't start becoming common until aluminum became more common in society. And then when aluminum became a lot more common after the 1940s, it was routinely used for building houses and other things. Then more and more people started getting Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, it accumulates in the brain immune cells, the microglia, but also in the neurons, the brain thinking cells. And it does get in both the senile plaques. Those are the ones with the beta amyloid protein in them. And those are extracellular. That's going to be important to know. Remember that the senile plaques, SPs, are extracellular. 
and the hyperphosphorylated tau, the ones that make the neurofibrillary tangles, the NFTs, those are intracellular. All right. Okay, so the reason why this will become a little bit of a big deal. So what does this guy think is going on, actually? He thinks what's happening is that the aluminum in these senile plaques, extracellular, is promoting ferrous iron redox cycling. And I talked about that in previous lectures, how iron, you know, ferrous just means iron in Latin. It'll redox cycle uh, between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, giving off electrons, producing reactive oxygen species. And he's saying it basically amplifies that process and can do a lot of damage especially when it's in an extracellular location, like in these senile plaques outside the cell, because there's a relative shortage of antioxidants in the extracellular space. Most of your antioxidants are located inside your cell, you know, like uh, vitamin E in the membranes, vitamin C in the cytoplasm, for example. Um, and he says early age onset people that can't handle uh, the aluminum so well, they get it at a younger age, like that patient Augusta lady, when she's 51, when she's diagnosed with the first case of Alzheimer's. Okay, and then he also believes that it's contributing to multiple sclerosis, and the reason he says that, he finds a lot of uh, aluminum in the brains of multiple sclerosis patients. And so what I'm saying is we're exposed to a lot of aluminum in tap water in most municipal water filtration places. We're exposed to a lot of it in food, and as of late, we've been exposed to a lot of it in the breathing air from the planes overhead. Okay, uh, some other points about it. Here's a guy, uh, Dean Murphy, he's a dentist who wrote a lot about F minus, and listen to what he says. Aluminum forms a complex with F minus, and that enables it to more readily cross the gut, be absorbed into our body, and to cross the blood brain barrier. Not good. Um, these complexes can act like a mimic of a phosphate group. Um, they interfere with phosphate transfer reactions, which sort of means like ATP related reactions. That's really not good. Um, aluminum plus F minus is basically an effective rat poison, okay? So it's either healthy for us in our water or it's a rat poison. And we know it definitely works on rats. So what do you think, okay? Are people in, who drink uh, F minus rats? Because there's going to be aluminum in their water. Is that good? I don't think so. It has synergistic toxicity, F minus with aluminum. And we also talk the iron has synergistic toxicity with aluminum, and that's put in tons and tons of food to so-called fortify them. Plus, it's intrinsically high, the iron in processed foods. And all these things go together synergistically to be highly toxic to your body. Um, F minus is especially toxic to the hippocampus, which is our memory center of our brain. That's great. Um, and that's in your water for most people in their tap water. And aluminum in it form complexes to get across the blood-brain barrier and damage brain cells. And the in inhalation of aluminum also goes to the medial temporal lobe where this is located, right next to the olfactory cortex, the entorhinal cortex, the memory center, the hippocampus. This is bad. This is all things to make you stupid and docile, a good little sheep. Um, F- minus also helps other neurotoxic ions to enter the brain. That's like I said, they add F- minus to tons of uh, neuropsych uh, pharmacology. Look at Prozac, okay? What's the name of it? Fluoxetine, okay? Because of the fluoride in there. What, look at um, fluoroquinolones. They add F- minus to it. Get increased blood brain barrier traversal, increased traversal into the testicles, into the ovaries, okay? Uh, it's pretty common to add F- minus to a lot of drugs to get increased crossing in the blood brain barrier, but it can also make some of these other metals. Um, well, that's F minus can get these other metals into the brain, and they're all toxic to your brain. Okay, here's a little bit of words from Jack Del Torre. So now this is interesting, but it's also a little bit funny. So Jack Del Torre is a brilliant guy who came up with the mouse equivalent uh, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion theory of dementia. And the reason I find it funny is he wants his theory to be the most important one and the one that people accept for the causation of Alzheimer's. All right, and so what he says is. Yes, heavy exposure to aluminum, like heavy exposure to other toxic metals, lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic can cause memory loss. He says aluminum is not, not the cause of Alzheimer's dementia. And he says this because in his opinion from the research he's done, countries with low aluminum exposure have similar incidence of um, uh, Alzheimer type dementia, even if they're not high in aluminum exposure. And so what he's basically saying is there's no significant difference in his opinion in the aluminum levels in the brains of Alzheimer's patient compared to age-matched controls. And therefore, he says, it is unlikely that aluminum plays a role in the pathogenesis, the causation of Alzheimer's. And the reason that's funny is the guy who studies aluminum for a living 
this Exley guy, he says, oh, no, 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 no. Aluminum is the most important thing in Alzheimer's. And when he does autopsies on, on brains, he finds a lot more aluminum in the brains of the Alzheimer's patients and in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay, and in the brains of patients with multiple sclerosis. Now, why do I think the whole thing is a little funny? Because, of course, each guy wants to promote his own theory and his own idea. That's human nature. But it's also funny because there's a lot of people, including myself, who think that Alzheimer's disease is kind of a big joke. Uh, Jack De La Torre is a little bit down that path. Alberto Espe is very much down that path. And let me explain. Alzheimer's disease... What's the historical finding, the question you can ask the patient? There is none. You can tell me if a person is demented, but there's nothing that specifically tells you that it's Alzheimer's. There's no historical question that, that makes the diagnosis. What's the physical exam finding? You know, you can put a stethoscope anywhere you want on their body, and you ain't getting no useful information. There's nothing from physical exam tells you a patient has Alzheimer's, okay? You can uh, do a brain CAT scan, an MRI, a PET scan, a SPECT scan, whatever you want. But you know what? Yeah, if you got lots of amyloid, that can lean you towards so-called Alzheimer's. But a normal person can have it. A person who's cognitively normal can have that. A person who's uh, demented might not have it. You can't confidently diagnose it from any imaging test. And I look at all these brains, thousands of them, for cognitive impairment. And I almost never see the so-called pattern of medial temporal atrophy in association with parietal convexity atrophy. Okay, so I usually just see diffuse cerebral atrophy. So the point I'm making is there's no great imaging test. Well, of course we can diagnose it by autopsy. And there used to be papers saying that the autopsy findings are pathognomonic. Pathognomonic means that's it. You know, 1 plus 1 equals 2. When you see that, you've got the diagnosis clenched. No, you don't. Okay? Albert Espe in his book, Brain Fables, Delatory, and others, and uh, this guy by the name of Gonzalez, is another big researcher, they all say, and there's other ones, that you can't really confidently diagnose Alzheimer's autopsy because there's many other diseases, including Parkinson's, including cognitively normal people, who have senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles at autopsy. So you can't, and so what I'm saying is that there's no treatment that works. There's no effective treatment for so-called Alzheimer's. So look at this so-called Alzheimer's dementia. And they claim it's the most common type of dementia, even though they have no good way to diagnose it. There's no good blood test. They're working on PTAU and some other stuff that might someday be useful. Okay, so you can't diagnose it when the patient's alive or dead and you have no treatment for it. Doesn't that sound like nonsense, like BS? I think it does. Okay, um, let's say he says at autopsy, there are Parkinson's patients with more uh, senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles um, than, than what you'd expect. And there are also patients who lived older, were healthier, so to speak, and they'll have more SPs and NFTs, sort of the opposite of what one would expect. Lots of people who meet criteria for Parkinson's will have Alzheimer's pattern. Um, and they're present in other diseases and they're present in heavy controls. They're not specific really hardly at all for Alzheimer's, okay? So the autopsy diagnosis is bogus. All right, um, let's see. Oh, Del Torre goes on. He says, senile plaques in the brain um, do not relate to dementia severity or neuronal synaptic loss, okay? He thinks they're pretty overrated, the beta amyloid plaques. He says, many people without dementia have the same density of senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles as the so-called Alzheimer's patients. Vascular dementia gets the senile plaques. They rarely occur in areas with, that are sort of abnormally affected during the early phases of Alzheimer's, like the basal nucleus of minor, okay, in the forebrain. Okay, so anyways, there's a problem with this whole uh, senile plaques, neurofibrillary tangle business, okay? Another thing that's uh, used in non-organic food, especially on soy, you know, the Roundup-related stuff, the glyphosate, it's a herbicide from non-organic food, and it binds to aluminum, and it also, kind of like what F- minus did, it increases gut absorption of aluminum and helps it cross the blood-brain barrier, okay? Not good. Um, and this comes from the work of Stephanie Seneff. There's her book right there. Okay, some more things about aluminum in the brain. Um, like I said, I like the word dementia, okay? Just call it dementia. Because this, this whole desire to call stuff Alzheimer's is a joke to get you to sell drugs. Okay, buy the drug. Well, the drug doesn't work. Well, you might as well give it a try. Yeah, do you really always have to give something a try when it might have tremendous side effects? Um, yeah, and they're now making these, you know, monoclonal antibodies <laughs> to treat it, okay? You know, no one ever talks about diet, exercise, and lifestyle. Plus, once the neurons are gone, you can't really bring back that neuron. That neuron had a memory 
from your childhood, okay? And if you just put a new neuron in there, it's not going to necessarily be correct, connected in the correct way to bring back your memories. You almost have to become a new person. Okay, um, like I say, there's tons of other things that are neurotoxic. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those now. Okay, here's some sources of aluminum. Deodorants, and the worst is to spray on. Don't, because when you spray it, you can inhale it into your nose and get it going on the highway to your brain. Aluminum cookware is a big deal. You can get a lot of aluminum into your food that way. Don't do it, and don't be an idiot scratching the food with a metal spoon or something. You know, use a wood spoon and cook on stainless steel. It's the best thing to cook on. Okay, there's aluminum anti-caking agents and salt, and that can add up to a lot of aluminum. There's especially tons of aluminum in some of these baking powders. I would never use baking powder. Or make sure, see if you can get one without aluminum in it, because there can be tons of aluminum in baking powder. Um, surprisingly large amount in pancake mix and milk powder, because it's an anti-caking agent, so that everything doesn't all stick together and it looks nice. Um, it's used as a whitener in breads. It's very common in candies and a lot of these food dyes. So, you know, these fancy looking candies, they're actually quite bad for you. You shouldn't be giving them to the children. Um, okay, like I had some relatives on one side of my family that would try to give all these candy to the kids. And I'm like, why do you do that? Not smart. Processed food always has more aluminum than, than unprocessed foods, according to the researcher here, Christopher. Um, soda pop cans, it's the, the cans made out of aluminum quite routinely, and they might have a lining in, a liner in there like BPA, a plastic, but it gets cracks in it and holes, and you end up leaching the aluminum into the drink, especially, you know, acidic energy drinks, you know, the carbonated drinks, so they're not good. Cheese, they'll put aluminum into cheese to stiffen it, so it's easier to cut. That's all bad. Um, some foods accumulate a lot of aluminum, like tea, for example. Tea also accumulates F-. And some people will tell you, oh, well, tea, it's got other chemicals in it that help reduce the aluminum absorption. Fine, but then the F- increases it. So you're still kind of screwed. I wouldn't recommend drinking tea. Um, sunscreens, cosmetics, personal care, a lot in these dyes, hair dyes, bad. Some medicines, antiacids, buffered aspirin, phosphate binders are all high in aluminum. Like I said, they put it in municipal water all the time as a clarifier. That's why you definitely want a water filter. Better yet, move to some area with well water where they don't have it added to the water. Infant formulas are often relatively toxic, okay? Soy, you know, goitrogenic, uh, processed with hexane, neurotoxin, aluminum, MSG. They used to put MSG in food formulas. Okay, we're not going to get into all that, but a lot of these food formulas are really bad for the babies. Okay, um, how do you avoid this stuff? Be a minimalist, okay? Eat a lot of plant foods. You get your antioxidants from them. And uh, like I said, sweat a lot for exercise. You can also add on the spank the monkey routine if you want. Um, silica water. The silica and water, and there's some waters that have a lot of that, like Fiji, for example. They enable you to, it, it chelates the aluminum, and then you void it out of your body and your urine. Um, so the only thing though I thought was a little funny was if you're talking about silica, which is a molecule uh, that contains silicone element. What I thought was funny about it is, you know, people talk about breast implant illness when you're spilling silico, silicone in the body. And I don't know if this is related. I don't know if it potentially causes any problem long term, but it crossed my mind. I would have to study it some more. Um, and again, you'd want to get your act together in advance, you know, decades in advance, so you prevent Alzheimer's. Because once you've gotten the neurons, prevent dementia, don't use that Alzheimer's word. Once you've got dementia, it's real hard to bring anything back. Okay, exercise, sweating is a good way to get it out of the body. You know, just take a look at your sweaty t-shirt, and there was some lady, she said something, make your pores a thousand sores. Yeah, to get the junk out of your body. You can also chelate it with that desferoxamine. Okay, these are some of the references to this talk. I got more slides, though. I got a couple more slides here. Um, aluminum high amounts in present uh, 10 times more in the brains of MS patients. Okay, there's another paper showing it to be common in the brains of multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, here's another paper showing that it has an excitotoxin effect, so it's ramping up the metabolic activity of the neuron uh, while simultaneously Dropping the energy production capacity, not good. Here's some excitotoxins. We've talked about this before. I'll give future lecture on these subjects as well. Just know that aluminum does it. 
so do your circa inhibitors, mitochondria inhibitors. They all have the same similar effect as an excitotoxin. They all kind of go together. Um, what are some of the things in senile plaques? Like we talked about beta amyloid protein. The aluminum's in both. The senile plaques, extracellular, and the neurofibrillary tangles, typically intracellular. Okay. All right, and they talked about the aluminum, especially dangerous in the context of high iron extracellular because they can just go autocatalytic and amplify a mag uh, huge amount, and there's not much antioxidants extracellular to slow them down. So anyways, that was the deal about aluminum and its relationship to dementia. I hope that was helpful.